Hello, and welcome to the Finnovate podcast. And we're going to be talking about a new book that Brett's got coming out called Techno Socialism. Brett, thank you so much for joining me. Can you talk a little bit about techno socialism and what sort of the thesis of the book is? And we'll dive in a little bit more at that point. Yeah. So, um, you know, back in uh, 2015, I wrote a book called Augmented Life in the Smart Lane, which sort of tackled how we would adapt to this world of, um, you know, highly automated world and lots of technology. But what I didn't do is work out really, you know, how this would affect governance and society and, you know, organizing principles around, you know, economics and so forth. And so I wanted to tackle that. Uh, but it came from really a position of this increasing economic uncertainty. So we have the pandemic that's obviously generated a lot of concern. But even prior to that, you know, um, the U.S. right now is in a period of great inequality, as a, as are some other economies around the world. Then you lay on top of that the impact of artificial intelligence on employment and then the impact of climate change, and you really sort of ratchet up this economic uncertainty. So I wanted to figure out how to how we as societies are going to sort of get through this period, this contentious period. So that was the birth of what, what we now call the rise of techno-socialism. The, the biggest problem we've got with, with the climate is we, we know now what's coming. There's debate over how, um, it, you know, uh, intense it's going to be in certain areas, how big sea rise is going to be, you know, and, and, and so forth. But um, we, we, a lot of it's really sort of baked in. So when you think about why it is that we haven't sort of been able to tackle this and get agreement on this, part of the core problem is that we tend to be quite short-term focused in our planning as a species. You know, we, we're focused on the next quarter, the next year in terms of financial reporting, or maybe, you know, the next two years or four years in terms of political cycles. But when it comes to planning out um, you know, things for 20 years in our future or 30 years in our future, you know, the, the big problem is we just ask who's going to pay for it. Um, and the problem with that type of um, issue in terms of very short-term focused planning is we're not committing enough funds or enough resources to these longer-term problems. So they are, they, they tend to be worse when they hit us, um, you know, because people are saying, well, you know, well, we don't even know if it's true yet, so let's see what happens, you know, but by the time it happens, it's, it's, uh, it's too late. So part of this was how are we going to adapt to a world with these, uh, these changes and where are we going to, um, you know, fund these massive, um, you know, projects globally? So, for example, we talk about 570 cities by 2050 inundated with sea level rise, 100-year flooding levels, displacing between 300 million and a billion people as eco-refugees. Now, this scale is almost unimaginable in terms of yeah. um, this problem. Um, and so if we wait until 2050 to do something about it, then obviously it's going to be far worse. But then how do you create a global program of um, you know, climate resilience and infrastructure and building um, support mechanisms for eco-refugees? And how do you change your views on, you know, and policies on immigration? So we dive into a lot of those things in terms of what could be some of the potential ways that we'll, we'll tackle that. Um, but these are, at, at the heart of it, very philosophical questions. You know, um, it real, really gets to the heart of, you know, what is humanity? What's our purpose on this planet? And, um, you know, how can we better work together to solve this problem? And that's really the core outcome of the book is that the best outcome is when humans as a species, you know, will collaborate together. That's really what we call optimal humanity. Yeah, a lot of people argue that they don't think it's going to be as bad as, you know, what it's predicted, you know, that the internet created new jobs when it came along. But, you know, artificial intelligence or highly automated societies is more akin to like the industrial revolution in terms of its, its impact on society rather than, you know, like the internet. 
Um, and so mm-hmm. uh, you've got a situation in the short term where you're going to have both labor shortages from lack of skilled you know, technology workers in, in the various fields, plus you're going to have displacement of people because of the fact that their jobs have been uh, replaced by uh, robots. Now, um, you know, this is going to create this, this gap. And so how do you fill that gap where people are now displaced because you know, you're in a highly automated society, um, you know, uh, 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 so part of it is you could do additional training and get them onto new skills, but is there going to be enough jobs for humans, enough hours to be worked in the future? The goal of automation is, is to automate humans out of, you know, the working situation. And the market is heavily incentivized to, for, um, you know, technology companies that deploy automation because it results in greater profits. You know, the largest, um, you know, nine out of 10 of the largest companies on the stock exchange is globally now are technology companies. So we know the market really, um, you know, uh, uh, gives big support to these entities that don't need as many people employed as, as they did in the old days. You know, the, the days of the industrial blue chips in the, the 1950s and 60s, as an example. So it's a, it's a philosophical change as to how we work. Um, you know, that work is no longer the mechanism that puts food on the table. So this raises the issue of things like universal basic income and you know, other mechanisms you might use as a social safety net for those that have been displaced by technology. Um, how do you pay for that? Well, you know, the wealth that's generated by artificial intelligence, as an example, might be one way, you know, taxing robots or, you know, algorithms uh, might be another way, um, you know, and then, uh, you know, uh, putting pressure on corporations to uh, create job transfer programs and things like that. But then on the flip side, you have this massive requirement to mobilize around climate change, you know, building seawalls for defenses of uh, cities so they don't get inundated with floodwaters, um, you know, building new cities, um, you know, uh, placements for the eco-refugees, you know, there, there's, a, a, there's tons, you know, carbon sequestration technology, um, you know, building these technologies around the world to extract carbon from the atmosphere. You know, we are talking about a new industry that's going to, um, you know, develop over the next 50 years or so, and it's going to be one of the biggest employers on the planet. But then, we have to think about new paradigms of how we're going to pay for that. So one of the things we promote in the book, as an example, is if you want universal basic income, you have to do like a um, you know, national service, uh, maybe two years of national service, which is focused on climate resilience, you know, or something like that, um, you know, to be able to qualify for that in the future. But um, overall, uh, it sort of seems like UBI is is a pretty much guaranteed outcome for humanity. Um, and the the good news of that is, you know, when you work in the future, the work that you do or our, our children do is going to be work that they're really passionate about, not work that has to put food on the table because the economy will be reprioritized where the main um, you know, goals of economies around the world will be to cater for the needs of their citizens first and foremost and the profits and growth and economic growth secondly. Because right now today what we have is if you want to sort of measure the success of economies, economists use measures like GDP growth and um, you know, uh, you know, stock market prices and things like this. Um, but the other measure, of course, is can the economy support the basic needs of its citizens? You know, can it ha- house everybody? Can it give them health care, education, enough food to eat, enough clothes on their back? You know, um, and if, if the economy can't provide those things for every citizen, you could rightly argue the economy's failed. So in the sure. situation where we have high inequality in the US today, you've got the most successful economy the world's ever seen in respect to economic uh, metrics, but in respect to inequality, then you know this is the greatest inequality of any uh, modern nation at any you know, time you know, in, in modern history that we see in the United States, the gap between the rich and the poor. So you, you can't argue that the economy is being effective for every citizen. So that rebalancing of, you know, economic output for the needs of the citizens first and foremost, and then the, you know, the the economy at large, secondly, is part of sort of the reframing of the role of economics and sort of reform of capitalism that we talk about in the book. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you start to see where the phrase techno socialism comes from as you listen to this answer. And I think it's really clear that the economy is not working for everybody at the moment. Change is coming. There's no way to avoid it. And the only answer is to make sure you change in the right way. And this actually brings me to one of the uh, pieces that I found really interesting in the book, the kind of four possible timelines that you laid out, these kind of four right. options based on how we, where we fall on this, this grid of whether it's a chaotic future versus a planned future, whether we're more inclusive and collective or more exclusionary and, and divided. And there are some, you know, potentially troubling quadrants on this uh, possible timeline. Um, of course, there's some, some good ones as well, but can you talk through that? And, and that'll probably be, you know, the amount we have time for today, but I think that'll sure. be an excellent teaser for, for what the book was all about. Yeah, so you got it right. You know, the quadrants are inclusive or collective um, versus exclusionary or individualistic and chaotic versus uh, planned. You know, they're the, that's the quadrant. And so in the upper right-hand corner where you have a planned society that's highly inclusive, you have techno-socialism. And we argue that that's going to have to be the philosophical evolution of humanity. Optimal humanity is when we're, you know, our, humans are our best when we work together. You know, that, that's the argument, right? Um, then then you've got on the other side, you've got uh, on the um uh, on the planned but exclusionary side, you've got what we call neo-feudalism, which is you know where the inequality that we have in the world today is sort of baked in. Then on the chaotic end, you've got two scenarios. One where there's a large sort of a rejection of technology and science writ large um, because of AI and its, uh, um, you know, uh, its effects. And so we called that the sort of lutter stand scenario um, and failed states where we just wait too long to do anything. So we, it's chaotic and, um, you know, exclusionary because, you know, we just, um, you know, we don't have a plan. And so the failed states could be, could be stimulated, for example, you know, if China decided to overtake Taiwan and at the same time China was becoming the world's number one economy and the US pushed back on that, um, you know, that could distract us from the larger mission of climate as an example. Um, Neo-feudalism is the one concern, I think, is, is sort of the more um, realistic um, alternative to techno-socialism where we get this inequality baked in and the technology, for example, longevity treatments where you get to live longer or gene therapy. These are only available to the richest, you know, uh, uh, you know, parts of society. And so you have this stratification that, that um, you know, comes between humanity. That's a real concern. And that's where we don't modify the existing sort of view of, of uh, capitalism. But all of those quadrants, um, you know, where it sort of comes together is really this question of, well, you know, how are we going to respond to this economic pressure, this economic uncertainty that's that's happening? And I refer to Will and Ariel Durant in the book, their book Lessons from History, which sort of basically shows that if in previous times throughout history, when we've seen this level of inequality, you either have, um, you know, legislated redistribution of wealth or you have revolution. And we're already, you know, at a point where, as I point out at the start of the book, that protests have increased a thousand percent in participation in the last 20 years across the planet because people are expressing their concerns about this economic uncertainty. So the pressure on us to really plan out the future and solve these problems has never really been more acute. Well, and certainly I think one of the things that's both terrifying and potentially optimistic is that the the potential outcomes which you list out all seem possible. Or they all you could imagine any one of them coming to pass. And I think this is the area where you need to really take a, a good hard look at things and say, well, which outcome is preferable? How do we get to that preferable outcome? And and there are certainly some large scale shifts that need to be made. And and some, you know, as the book points out, that will be made automatically, some that aren't optional, yeah. some that are that's going exactly. to come for us whether we want them or not. Yeah, that's exactly the debate we wanted to have. It's like, you know, okay, if you don't like what I've proposed, if you don't like this, you know, collective approach to humanity that shrinks government through automation and is able to provide, you know, universal health care and universal education at a very low cost, lower cost than what we have today, as an example, if you don't like that model because it sounds like socialism to you, then here are the other models that are, are most likely. Which of those would you choose? And, right. you know, the, the, and ultimately, 
ultimately that's the sort of conversation we have to have is like, if we're not going to change the system, if you think this is the best system that humanity is ever going to come up with what we have today, then let's play that out. And let's, you know, as a, as a society, let's have the conversation about which way we want this to go and, you know, really honestly assess, you know, where humanity is going to go in the future. And these things that are going to happen, you know, the, um, the, you know, the ongoing inequality, the impact of AI, highly automated societies, and the impact of climate are going to have to make us philosophically think about what it what it is to be human and what it is to be a species on this planet and how we should be working together. That's ultimately, you know, what why we wrote the book. 